welcome everyone to our cooperative extension learn at home webinar series brought to you by the college of the environment and life sciences my name is vanessa i am an extension educator and i coordinate the master gardener program and i will be happy to introduce tonight's presenter in a moment sage lynch and my colleague here at extension but first we'll just give you a few messages a few housekeeping items if you want to go <laughs> Next slide, please. There we go. Um, so if you don't know already, Cooperative Extension is the arm of the university that reaches out to the community, bringing all of the good science from the land grant university system to our communities, um, both in Rhode Island and across the whole US. There's a land grant university in every single state, sometimes more than one. Um, and our guiding principles are that we are here to improve quality of life as well as the environment by teaching folks and getting them to adopt different practices in that respect. And we believe in environmental and social justice and are always striving to deepen our cultural understanding while um, addressing as many community needs as possible, which is why we are so glad to be able to bring this to you virtually um, during the pandemic. And hopefully we're reaching a huge community, I think. We have 107 attendees so far. And here's all of our areas of focus. If you want to go right ahead to the next slide, please. Oh, I hear Stella. <laughs> okay, if you have any questions, please use the question and answer box, which is the one that I will be monitoring. We'll have a time to answer those questions at the end. And um, thank you in advance. We will be sending you a brief survey via a link. This survey allows us to keep offering these wonderful programs and to assess how it is that we're doing and how we can improve. This session is being recorded, so you will find the recording within a few days up on our URI Cooperative Extension YouTube channel. You'll find all of the previous Learn at Home series there. And um, they do have closed captioning for the hearing impaired. So if you would like closed captioning, you can check out that recording. And it's easy to just type that into the chat box. URI Cooperative Extension YouTube and it'll pop right up. And there's good resources there. Is it okay? Now, please to welcome Sage Landerman. She has actually been with Cooperative Extension as an educator for 12, over 12 years. Um, and she teaches not only the science behind composting, but also food preservation and food safety for gardeners and farmers and the community. And you may recognize her as she was the host of the popular NBC, NBC Town Plant Pro segment. <laughs> for about a decade. So please join me in welcoming Sage Landerman. Sage, will take it away. All right, sounds good. Thanks, Vanessa, and good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm really excited to be here and talk about something that I'm pretty passionate about and something that uh, my family and I have been doing for a really long time and, and just something that is just so incredible for the environment, uh, but also, uh, you know, for the garden. I think that's probably two of the main reasons that everyone is here tonight. And of course, you know, uh, because of this pandemic that we're in, I think one of the um, good things about it is it's really kind of um, had people, you know, it's it's kind of allowing all of us to spend some time at home and really start gardening a little bit more. We are seeing that anecdotally and we're seeing that in really um, powerful numbers based on a lot of the webinars that we're giving and the hits that we're getting on our website and the videos that you guys are all watching and participating in. So we know that uh, more and more people want to learn how to grow their own food and they want to take care um, of their grass in healthy ways, you know, whatever, whatever the reasons are. But uh, the goal here for tonight is to get you even better at doing that by learning to use what you already have um, and not having to invest in, in too many expensive things, maybe not even anything at all, um, and turning those resources, we have it here called turning waste, but really we should think about those as resources um, into want, into what a lot of gardeners, um, you know, folks, uh, folks in the industry tend to call black gold or also humus. So as Vanessa said, um, 
you know, I am a community engagement and outreach uh, coordinator. I like to do a lot uh, about spreading the word of cooperative extension to my colleagues, but I also wear this other hat where I'm a produce safety educator. Um, so along the way, uh, towards the end of this, I'm just going to give you some couple tips, connect the dots on how we want to make sure we're making good decisions when we think about what we put into our compost pile. Um, so I'm excited to talk to you guys about that and more. Um, and just one more little thing before we get started. Uh, this really, this, the goal of this presentation is to get you guys comfortable with composting. It's not going to be heavy on the science. It's not going to be heavy on the how do I get it really, really hot and get my compost really, really fast. Um, you know, that's for when you have a lot of machinery um, or you have a lot of the inputs um, that are needed. And I'll touch on those lightly. But the goal of this is to really get you guys to take a look at what you are already accumulating and what you perhaps have around the house and get you guys turning that into uh, humus or compost and turning that back into your soil and improving it and a whole bunch of other things. So let's jump right in and I'll explain that just a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Let's see what's going on here. All right. So in a nutshell, so what, what is composting? So simply put, composting is when we blend certain materials. And the proper way to do it is blend materials that tend to be high in carbon and blending those in with things that are high in nitrogen. So a quick example of something that's high in carbon is something like the leaves that are falling right now in abundance. Um, if you don't have a lot of leaves and you, you live in Providence or you live in another city, no worries. I'm going to go in later in this presentation and cover some of the things that are also high in carbon. Some of the things really quickly that probably come to mind when you're looking at this, this scrap pail that a lot of us leave in our kitchen, number of different ways to collect those simple uh, scraps, but here's a pretty little bucket. Um, you can use a Ziploc or Tupperware or anything like that as well. But we're collecting uh, fresh food scraps. But of course, we have other things that are high in nitrogen that I'll cover as well. So what we like to do is find the perfect balance of carbon to nitrogen. We find a place in our um, yard or in our landscape, um, and we basically blend it together and cr we create this ecosystem that attracts different organisms to it. And if we do it properly, um, we can do it uh, where we are not sending offensive odors to our neighbors and we can do it in a somewhat timely manner, although there's a little bit of patience with backyard gardening because a lot of times we don't get those temperatures super hot right off the bat. So it takes a little bit longer, maybe as, as little as six months if you're really a go-getter, but chances are more like nine to 12 months. And hopefully that end result is that uh, yummy compost that's really great for your garden. So let's explore just a little bit longer a little bit more about that. So we have that compost pile. We have that ecosystem. Um, how does this happen? So I got to tell you, a lot of times people tend to think that the sun is what has uh, a lot to do with the compost pile. But actually, the sun has very little um, to do with the compost and actually can really dry out the compost process. So you can see here that this compost pile is uh, situated in an area that, you know, is kind of shady. A uh, little bit of sun is OK. Um, we'll talk about what kind of moisture your compost uh, pile likes. But we're creating this ecosystem by adding things that are high in carbon and, and nitrogen and blending them and getting that just right. You're going to attract all these different beneficial organisms. Of course, we're going to add oxygen along the way and maybe even a little water if it tends to get dried out. And by doing that, you're going to create this whole web of organisms. And this is literally just a few um, of those organisms that we might see. So obviously ones that we can see with our eyes, like worms and centipedes, there's going to be spiders, all kinds of different um, critters. But the reason why those come is actually because of the bacteria and the fungi, so the mold. So look at that orange right there. So obviously we're not going to you know, throw in a, a whole orange. We're going to try to eat that orange first. But of course, sometimes you know they come and they're not so great and they get a little moldy. Um, well, unlike you and I, worms do not have uh, teeth, so they have to wait for these microorganisms, organisms um, that we can't see with our naked eye. We have to see underneath a, micro, uh, a microscope. 
So the worms come in and will eat those molds and those fungi and all those things. And it creates this whole web and they're eating the resources that we're putting in there. And what they're leaving behind is what you're seeing in that bottom left photo. So what's important to kind of take away from this is maybe two things. One, that you don't have to put your pile in full sun, might be detrimental. And two, um, that it's not just the things that we can see that are really powerful in this composting process. Um, they say that in about two handfuls of really well done compost, you have more microorganisms living than people on the planet. So uh, really beneficial, lots of lots of things going on. So let's go a little bit further and we'll explore that a little bit. Oh, and one more thing before I forget. So one of the main reasons that we do uh, periodically infuse our pile with oxygen is because we want to attract the microbes that need oxygen to survive. If we just kind of throw things in a pile and walk away and never visit it, not only will you might attract certain organisms that you don't want by not uh, having a lot of activity with your compost pile, but you'll also be attracting anaerobic organisms that don't need oxygen to survive. And then and compost piles can kind of smell like sulfur or that rotten egg smell, and that's when your neighbors aren't going to be happy, or perhaps your significant other or your family as well. So let's make sure that doesn't happen, and we'll give you some more tips. So just, you know, I kind of touched base on this in the beginning, but let's look at this from an environmental perspective. So, so why compost? Um, so here in Rhode Island, we have a landfill um, and it is precious space. I don't think there's a single town in Rhode Island that is going to give up uh, their space to create another landfill. So by composting, we're going to preserve that precious of course, reduce associated gas emissions that are associated with hauling um, those items back and forth to the landfill and, and processing them. One of the things that people tend to get a little confused about is mm, what's really so bad if I'm sending my food scraps in the garbage into the landfill? Isn't it the same thing as sending it into a compost pile? Doesn't it break down eventually? The answer to that is no. If we take a look at how much a landfill breaks down in a year, we're looking at a couple of inches and that's really just to natural settling. So by keeping some of these resources out of the waste stream, um, we're not only doing something that's really good for the environment, but uh, doing something that's really good uh, for our soil as well. It's relatively easy composting. I'm not gonna lie. I mean, sometimes it, it is a little bit of work, but so is taking out the garbage and so is bringing the garbage uh, to the transfer station or whatever you need to do with it. Um, and it also in that regard saves money. Um, paying for your garbage one way or another, whether it's in your taxes or direct hauling fees. Um, and if you're gardening, chances are you are. Maybe it's it's as simple as a, a tomato plant or uh, more, more than that, a, a vegetable garden, perennial shrubs, trees, what have you. Um, you're going to save money in so many different, um, so many different ways. But let's take it one more step further and talk about why we, we do this for um, the landscape as well. So a lot of times people think as compost as fertilizer, that it's super high in nutrients. And that's not really the case. We want to think about compost or humus as organic matter. So simply food for organisms that live in our soil. If you're gardening, I highly recommend, if you're growing food especially, I highly recommend taking the time do a soil test now. Uh, at URI Cooperative Extension, we'll test the pH of your soil for free, but you can also take it one step further and send it out to a soil testing lab like our friends over at UMass or UConn. And for a very simple test, it will tell you how much organic matter you have in the soil. And if that number is low, that's where compost can play a really, really important, uh, important part. So we think about think about it as feeding the organisms, the healthy organisms that play such an integral role of keeping our plants healthy, health, healthy, uh, helping to suppress uh, those diseases, um, a whole bunch of different things. 
Adding compost also um, improves moisture retention, so less watering. And we know in the last couple of weeks, uh, luckily we have gotten some rain, um, but that's extremely important, uh, especially for those places that are more prone to drought. So by adding uh, compost, um, compost especially made with a lot of leaves, is really, really good at holding water. So it's less watering that we need to do. Um, nutrient retention. So it doesn't mean, um, like how I mentioned before, compost is not fertilizer. Compost does have a solid amount of nutrients in it, and it has a lot of nutrients that are often missing in our synthetic fertilizers, so those micronutrients. So we're going to be um, uh, using less fertilizer, but it's also, this is this is kind of something that tickles me and gets me really excited about applying compost into our garden, is compost tends to be really negatively charged, those humic acids. So when we apply compost um, into our gardens, it will, just like we learned in probably maybe fourth grade, that uh, negative ions are going to attract to positive ions. So what's positive in the garden that that compost is going to attract to? So things like uh, calcium, uh, potassium, magnesium. So when you put compost in and that broccoli plant that you planted um, that really is a lover of calcium and those things I just mentioned, those humic acids are going to hold on to those nutrients and keep them there for when your plant needs them instead of washing away. So less fertilizing, keep those nutrients in place, and it's also going to, uh, like sort of I just mentioned, improve soil characteristics. So it's going to make heavy soils or sandy soils uh, easier to work in. And we'll take a look at that, that bin style. That bin style comes uh, in handy, especially if you're working in a community garden setting or in a family setting. So we'll dive all into the world of bins in just a little bit. Okay, so in the next couple of slides, we're going to really kind of talk about how do I compost in terms of what should I really be putting in there? And what, maybe even more importantly, should I keep out? Because there are a lot of things. Um, can think, can all things compost? A lot of things really can, but does that mean that we should put it into our pile? I would argue no. Um, we're gonna talk about the particle size. We're gonna talk about the different types of bins, uh, moisture, turning, um, and I'll probably throw in a whole bunch of other things at you as well. All right, so this is really, like I said, not a, a really scientific um, aspect of the recipe. Um, if you are, if you do want to take this another level and learn a little bit more about doing this on a larger scale and really understanding those carbon to nitrogen ratios, um, by all means, email me on the side and I can get you some information. But for backyard gardening purposes, we want to make sure that we are uh, learning the art of composting, which is blending those high carbon ingredients with those high nitrogenous ingredients. Uh, growing up, I hope my mom isn't watching. I don't think that she is. Uh, growing up, uh, my mom didn't grow up uh, really gardening or composting, but as uh, our family sort of increased, she saw a lot of the of food scraps in our, our garbage that was getting larger and larger. And she had known about composting from a friend and she kind of just gave it a roll. And uh, I don't think she connected uh, with Cooperative Extension or other resources and sort of just thought that you could take some of scraps that accumulate in your kitchen and throw it in a pile and somehow magically you end up with compost. And I'll tell you, part of my job growing up, it's a wonder that I am still so passionate about composting, was to bring out that bucket and it was disgusting because it was sludgy and wet and um, it smelled. Um, so you really want to make sure you're blending, um, if not more in terms of volume, uh, those high carbon ingredients into your operation. So one of the ways that I keep up on this um, as a family, and I will give a shout out to my family later because they're a huge part of the composting, is when you go to um, empty that food scrap pail into your compost pile, you want to make sure that you do have um, a good supply of those high carbonaceous ingredients so that you can kind of keep up with this recipe. So basically, you know, you're opening up that pile, dumping in the food scraps and then covering them up right away. And that's going to keep up with that, that ratio that's needed. It's also going to help silence some of the smells and keep some critters um, that you probably do not want visiting. That could be a dog. It could be a, a, a maybe a mouse, a rat in certain types of situations. I don't want to scare anybody into composting because it's it's easy to keep some of those uh, critters out. But really the, the art I would say of composting is learning to blend these materials. And again, we're gonna go into those uh, that more specifically of what those materials can look like if you don't have an abundance of leaves. 
Okay, so let's take a look. So in terms of sources of carbon, I'm going to go over a couple of these a little bit um, in depth. So straw, straw is a great one. Um, notice that we have straw written here and not hay. Straw is going to be the cut where there is not seeds. Um, if you put hay into a compost pile um, and you don't get that compost really, really hot, which a lot of backyard gardening piles don't get that hot, um, you are going to uh, still end up composting it, but you might not kill the seeds. So you go to spread that compost in your garden and then mm, not so great, you've got a lot of hay uh, growing. So, um, you know, if you're decorating with straw uh, this this fall or using it in your garden as mulch, um, do that and uh, put it in the compost pile. You don't really have to shred it up or anything like that. It's gonna add a nice bulk to your pile. So straw, tomato stalks and corn stalks, um, again, you can just sort of rough them up a little bit, but you don't have to put them through a shredder or anything like that. And that's the same with that uh, with prunings as well. Um, those those not those uh, prunings that we do a lot of the times in the spring, a little bit now in the fall, but it's good to keep those seeds up for our pollinators and our bird friends. Um, but you know those those non woody prunings, um, newspaper. So if you are going to use newspaper, uh, you want to make sure that you're using um, not the the waxy, super color, um, the you know shiny material. But if you just use a uh, regular newspaper, it can have color. That's okay. But again, it doesn't have that shiny uh, sheer to it. Um, ink is vegetable based. Most of the time, it's just soy based ink, so it's perfectly fine for the compost pile. I would probably say not as many nutrients or, or things in there as, as something like leaves, but it is totally acceptable. Um, cardboard, cardboard, uh, I'm not gonna lie, it can be a little tricky to compost with because you do wanna get it a little bit small. You're not just gonna take a cardboard box and throw it into your compost pile and expect uh, those microorganisms uh, to break it down. Um, really great for um, creating lasagna gardening. If you don't know what that is, you'll wanna look that up on the side. That's really great if you're starting new beds or trying to get rid of um, grass to grow, um, uh, have you know established gardening beds. Uh, cardboard, of course, is, is, is and newspaper fine to put in the recycling bin. We have a we have an end used for that. Um, but in a pinch, it can be used. It is it is a source of carbon. Mentioned those prunings. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about, you know, if you're, you know, uh, pruning out some of those more woody type things like, uh, you know, an apple tree or a tree that came down, a dead tree. Um, that's a little bit different from, you know, going in and, and clipping some uh, woody, you know, non-woody perennials. Um, so we'll look at what's needed um, in terms of getting some of those those more dense type things into the compost pile. So egg cartons, of course, we're not talking about inorganic uh, items like plastic. We're talking about the, the ones that come into cardboard. Again, kind of tricky sometimes. Same, I put it in that same category as cardboard. Dryer lint, probably not super high in carbon, but it's not high in nitrogen either. Um, is perfectly fine. Wood shavings, chips, sawdust. Of course, we're talking from clean wood, not pressure treated, not painted. Um, I had a little experiment uh, one year where our neighbor took down a tree and the, the wood chips were really, really kind of big and I was a little nervous. Um, that it wasn't going to break down, you know, in less than a year, but sure enough, it, it did. Uh, it was no problem. Um, pine needles. People get a little nervous about pine needles because they are aware that uh, they are acidic. Um, but as long as you're not, you know, exclusively composting pine needles and vegetable scraps, you should be good to go. And I would say that's a probably a good rule of thumb with composting in general is not to pick, you know, two different ingredients. Try to treat it like uh, the buffet when we go to a restaurant. You don't want to just load up on the mac and cheese, right? You want to take a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Um, and that's the same thing with compost. It's going to spread out uh, the risk with composting just one thing or two things. So try to do as many um, of these things as possible. And you'll have... Uh, you'll attract a whole uh, diverse group of microorganisms and it's going to lead uh, yield a much more beneficial uh, compost.
humus. All right, so let's take a look a little closer uh, look at sources of things that are higher in nitrogen. So probably the first thing that comes to mind is fruit and vegetable scraps. So you can notice here that I used the word fresh. We want to make sure that we're not using leftover pasta primavera or pizza that we didn't finish. I don't know who probably doesn't finish pizza. Um, but I have, hopefully my sister is not watching, I have uh, seen my sister try to compost some of those leftovers. Um, and that's not really great either. I'm not saying that it can't be composted and that our larger scale composters or more experienced composters probably could get away with that. Um, but if you're just entering the world of composting, you really don't want to be attracting uh, carnivores and dogs uh, to our compost pile. And a lot of times those leftovers can be higher in grease and fats and oils, and it really suppresses the compost process. So fresh fruit and vegetable scraps. So as you're you know, making your strawberry rhubarb pie or apple pie this time of year, um, the cores, you're making a salad, so the tops and the bottoms of things, you know, like, uh, let's see, the ends of cauliflower and broccoli, all of those things, and some of those things that you can see in here, banana peels, um, you know, you can throw in an avocado pit and a peach pit, but I can probably almost guarantee that when you uh, go to apply your finished compost to your garden, you'll find a lot of those things like pistachio shells. So over time, you'll probably learn that mm, those things maybe aren't going to work out so well in the compost pile, but fresh fruit and vegetable scraps for the most part are, are really great, especially when it's uh, uh, there's a lot of diversity. Um, I'll also say just really quickly, this is a little not relevant to the topic, but um, one of the things that we do in my household is we'll keep a um, like a Ziploc bag or a Tupperware in the freezer. We fill that up with things that would make a good soup broth. So, um, you know, the like I was mentioning before, the ends of uh, bottoms of celery, um, broccoli stalks, although some of that is edible. We'll collect those things. We'll um, put it into a pot once we get a nice big, you know, uh, bag full of them. And we'll put just simple water over it, some herbs, some seasonings and stuff like that. We'll make a broth. We'll strain it. So then we have all of the food matter separated and that is still okay to put in the compost pile. So you can make a broth, reap even more benefits um, from some of those vegetables uh, and then throw them in the compost because there wasn't a lot of oil. You know, I might use a little bit of extra virgin olive oil, but I'm not using a ton of, of oil and things like that. It's simply just steamed or, or sorry, boiled in water. So a little plug for broth there. So other sources of nitrogen, uh, grass clippings, although it is best to keep grass clippings um, on the lawn, if that is something, uh, having a, a healthy lawn is important to you or you have lawn at all, or, you know, just sometimes we go on vacation and the lawn gets too long, too long um, when we have a lawnmower that collects it. Uh, when you put it into your compost pile and it's still green, then it's high in nitrogen. If they've dried out a little bit, then you've lost that nitrogen, it's gonna be higher in carbon. Uh, but grass clippings are, are fine uh, for the compost pile. Um, and of course, uh, in this case, if you're making compost to grow food, you really want to think um, about if you're using treated grass clippings or not. Um, if you're growing food and you, you know, and you're, you're creating compost, you really, really want to think about what you're putting into your compost pile. I'm not saying that these things won't break down, but the, some of the heavy metals um, and the chemicals and things that uh, can bioaccumulate, they can turn into, um, other chemical compounds and sometimes be even more harsher than they were to begin with. So you want to make sure you're really thinking about the things that you're putting into your compost pile, especially if you're using it to grow food. So coffee grinds and their uh, filters, as well as tea bags, um, perfectly fine for the compost pile throw that all in there. Um, you can see uh, if you've learned anything about composting or taking another, another class in it, um, a lot of times they tend to talk about things that are higher in carbon as your browns and things that are higher in nitrogen as your greens. I tend to not go down that route um, because here's a perfect example coffee grinds, they are brown, but they are actually higher in nitrogen. Um, so I kind of stay away from that and just say high carbon, high nitrogen. Um, and these are, are the, uh, the coffee grinds are going to be considered nitrogen. Take a little sip of water here. Okay, so my food safety hat is going to come on uh, pretty soon here, but look at these lovely chickens. 
All right, so let's have a conversation about manure. So manure is a, a source of nitrogen um, for composting. If you're going to go down this route, you want to make sure you're using manure that we commonly refer to as herbaceous. So meaning it is a manure that comes from an herbivore. So you probably already know what an herbivore is, but just in case, it's sort of synonymous with uh, people being vegetarians. Uh, they have a plant-based diet, even though chickens actually are probably true omnivores. Omnivores, they eat insects and stuff like that. They are very, uh, very different um, from our carnivores. Um, regardless, um, there are still pathogens that can cause foodborne illnesses. So you do, I'm going to get into this a little bit more, you do want to be really cautious. So if you are going to use manure in your compost pile, the only type of manure that you want to do is from animals such as chickens, uh, let's see, goats, lambs, sheep. Um, so animals that have a herbaceous diet, uh, horses as well. So let's just take that one more notch forward. So again, I think a lot of us, I don't have to probably go down the route of foodborne outbreaks, um, think salmonella and E. coli. A lot of us unfortunately know about these things now. We all remember the spinach outbreak, um, cantaloupe, uh, maybe some of you remember that. Most recently, we've had issues with onions and peaches. And a lot of times, um, outbreaks related to produce, they do originate from animal manure. Um, maybe not sometimes directly. Sometimes it can happen because um, the pathogens from the manure end up in our, in our water. Um, but regardless, what I want you to walk away is understanding that no matter what, all manure contains pathogens. So if your manure came from a chip, sheep or a lamb, uh, just because they're not eating um, some of these, uh, you know, meat and things like that, it doesn't mean that there's not pathogens. It's actually, they're, it's pretty loaded in pathogens. Uh, if you were composting something like uh, manure from a dog or a cat, which is a huge no-no, the difference there is that there is even more pathogens. So with all manure, there is risk. There is arguably less risk with some of the manure coming from these herbivores, but there's still risk. So adding manure to a compost pile really should be only done by experienced composters because you really need to get that compost pile hot um, to kill those pathogens. Think about chicken. How do we get rid of pathogens from um, chicken? Well, we we cook it, we put it in the oven. So our compost pile is very similar in, in that analogy where the compost pile is the oven. But if we're not getting that oven hot enough, then we're not gonna kill those pathogens. So, um, and one more word of caution, because uh, I know a lot of us are new um, to garden. Even though our great grandparents might have done it, we really don't want to be adding manure directly to um, our soil. Um, some of these pathogens can persist in uh, the soil for a really, really long time. Um, and a lot of times, what happens is take that, take a look at that lettuce up there. So let's let's pretend like that lettuce uh, was top dressed with manure um, or compost that didn't get really hot that had a lot of manure. And we go out there and we wa uh, we water our lettuce or we get a good good rainstorm what could potentially happen is that soil could splash onto the lettuce and i don't know about you but i don't cook my lettuce so there's not a heat step so that's why sometimes we see some of these outbreaks related to produce that we're not fully cooking and of course who wants to cook lettuce and who wants to cook these things uh, to death we don't so we want to make sure we're taking uh, these preventative steps and connecting these dots so if you are Still, you're you're gonna do it. You want to add compost, uh, or you want to add manure to your compost pile. I urge you to get a thermometer so you can just make sure that those temperatures are getting hot. And one way, there's kind of two different routes you can take if you want to, you know, get get into it with your thermometer. Um, it's a special composting thermometer. Has a very long probe. You put it into the middle of your compost pile, um, and to make sure that you are killing the pathogens, E. coli, sem. Uh, things like that, you want to make sure you get that compost up to temperature for 131 degrees. This is what our National Organic Program um, recommends and um, a lot of our other regulatory food safety guidelines. And you achieve that temperature for a minimum of 15 days. And during those 15 days, you have to turn your pile so 
everything on the outside gets a chance to get on the inside a minimum of five times. That sounds like a lot, right? So it kind of is, um, unless you're getting into that business. Um, the other way to kind of go about it, if you don't have a thermometer or you're just, you don't have the time for that, but you do have a couple of chickens and you do want to throw in a little bit of manure. So what your best is at that point is to um, follow the steps that we're talking about here tonight, create your compost um, that has a little bit of that manure in there. And then what you want to do is when you're all done in your vegetable garden, so you've harvested everything, um, you want to incorporate that compost into the soil, try to work it into the soil as much as possible. Um, that's good from for a horticultural perspective as well. But you want to get it in there before the ground freezes. So that's mm, typically mid-December, but the year it can be a little different year to year so i hope i i didn't scare people too much um because you know i think there there is definitely a place for it but just a word of caution for backyard um composting you know we have fabulous large-scale composters scattered throughout the state that are getting their their compost piles ridiculously hot um and it's it's not something that we have to be concerned about but in our home piles if we're just kind of throwing everything in there and walking away and and you know applying it of course during the the gardening season or the growing season um those stars can align and we can run into trouble so you just a word of caution all right, let's get off the food safety train. Well, I guess we'll stay on it for one more second. So just a couple of different things that you want to think about keeping out of your compost pile. So diseased plants, especially, you know, things like tomato blight or potato, um, like any of those heavy, those heavy diseases you want to keep out of your compost pile because um, you don't want to be spreading that even further. If you had some squash and zucchini that inevitably, you know, tends to get powdery mildew, that's Fine. The compost pile um, does usually get hot enough for that. You're not going to be spreading powdery mildew, so no problem there. Uh, wood ash, so if you um, have a fire pit outside or a wood stove inside, you do actually want to refrain from putting wood ash directly into your compost pile. Um, you can lose a lot of uh, nitrogen that way, and that's one of the, uh, the things that we're trying to do is create compost that does have nitrogen in there. It can affect the pH, a number of different things, so there's you know, not too many things if you're you're using uh, wood completely to uh, heat your home to do with that wood ash, it gets a little bit tricky, but um, you do want to keep it out of the compost pile. There is some old uh, cooperative extension literature out there um, that used to call used to say wood ash was fine, but now um, through the power of science, we've realized it's really not a not a good thing, science and research. So keep wood ash out there. Keep uh, those invasive plant species out of there. We don't want to keep those from spreading. Chemically treated plants or grass clippings, I mentioned that. Poisonous plants, things like poison ivy. I'm not saying that the compost pile is not going to break down the plant, but the allelic makes us itchy, can persist. Um, I've read horror stories of people spreading compost, um, not knowing that 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 chemical compound that makes us itchy was still in there. Um, so poisonous plants, things with um, lots of meat, bones, fat, grease, grease or oil. I mentioned that you just don't want to suppress the compost pile um, and attract carnivores. Same reason why we don't add dairy products or cooked foods. And I mentioned carnivorous manure because it's very high in pathogens. And cat litter, even though you might be using a, um, you know, environmentally friendly based litter. Um, that does not mean that the manure and some of the other the feces that was left behind is uh, safe or suitable. Uh, there are some types of units that are out there designed specifically to break down um, our dog and cat waste. So you can look those out on the side, but again, we would never be using that uh, to grow uh, produce. All right, so let's just talk about the size of the things that we're putting in there. Um, a lot of folks think that you need to shred your leaves before you put them into the compost pile. And that's not necessarily true, but um, by giving things a quick chop like leaves, which you could simply do with a lawnmower, um, you can uh, shred them up with your lawnmower and then put them into your compost pile and it's going to expedite. It's going to speed the compost process um, up, but it's also going to allow you to get rid of or compost so many more leaves. If you were to take leaves, you know, unshredded and, and 
put them um, into a pile, that's going to fill up rather quickly. But if we break those down um, by mowing over them and then putting them in the compost pile, you're going your compost pile is going to be able to keep up with a lot. Um, and honestly, um, a lot of us, uh, if we live, you know, um, in certain parts of the state more leaves than we probably can handle in our compost pile. So there's a great article that came out in the Providence Journal just this week. There is great literature out there um, with various cooperative extensions. Uh, and there's this whole campaign about leaving the leaves. And uh, I think a lot of us are used to uh, thinking that we need to get the leaves off of our property. But honestly, you can mow over your leaves and keep them on the lawn as well. So, so look that up. Um, we also have this practice in our family of um, mowing them and then putting them back into our beds and saving um, money on mulch and using that to keep weeds down and to help uh, retain moisture. So there's so many different things uh, to deal with leaves. But if you shred them up, uh, you're going to be able to handle more. And another tip that I have is try to keep an, a, like a, another trash bin or some type of barrel just full and ready of shredded leaves. That way, when you go out there throughout the year, when we don't have an abundance of leaves and you empty that canister that has a lot of food scraps, you can quickly uh, cover it up with those shredded leaves that are, are right near your compost pile. All right, so let's see. And, you know, if you do have uh, a chipper, um, some I think you can rent those as well. Um, that's what you'd really probably have to do for some of those woody uh, prunings. You, you would want to get the particle size a lot slower. Um, of course, you can put a giant stick or a limb into your compost pile, but in nine to 12 months, you will still have that stick in your compost pile. Um, some of us have a leaf blower. And it actually comes with another attachment where you can suck those leaves up and they break them down as well. So we can blow the dust off of that part, bring it out and break our leaves down that way. So hopefully maybe you have one of these things or uh, if you don't have leaves because you live in the city, you can look me up and you can come down to my house and you can help me rake leaves. <laughs> All right, so how big should my compost pile size uh, be? Like I uh, mentioned before, my mom used to just kind of dump stuff in a pile and it never really got build, uh, big enough to build up that core. So it's in the center of that pile where the heat accumulates. So you want your compost pile to be at least three feet by three feet by three feet. You can look at this picture over here. I know it's in Celsius, but you get the picture. The heat is generated in the center of that pile. Um, so that's why when we turn our piles, we're not only doing that because we want to um, infuse it with oxygen and attract those beneficial microorganisms, uh, but we also want to give everything on the outside of our pile a chance to get into the center of the pile where those high temperatures are achieved. So the maximum dimension, unless you have uh, machinery, is really you know five feet by five feet by any length. You could do a long windrow. It just gets really hard to uh, to turn it. Um, but chances are, based on the title of this presentation, you are looking for more of a small scale um, composting operation. Um, so that's what we're going to get into next and in looking at those those piles. But before we do that, uh, in a nutshell, you want to make sure your compost pile stays moist. Um, and if you get that moisture uh, or sorry, if you get those uh, blending of those materials uh, correctly and you don't add too much of the food scraps, um, then then you probably will stay right on track. You want it to always kind of be damp like a wrung out sponge. So around 40 to 60 percent uh, is ideal. Of course, um, you can always add a little bit of water uh, if you need to or, you know, if it's going to rain, you can take the top off, um, but you don't want out as well. A lot of these organisms that are in our pile, if not all of them, they come from um, the soil where it is damp and dark and uh, most of the time moist. So we want to replicate uh, that as well but, but when we're creating that, that compost ecosystem. So damp like a wrung out sponge. All right, so let's let's talk it out a little bit about um, adding oxygen because again, we don't want to offend those neighbors. So uh, there's kind of two different uh, schools of thought on this, and they both kind of come into play at different times. So you can see the gentleman here on the left. He has um, probably a pitchfork. You could also use a nice big piece of rebar, and it's basically uh, going going into your pile. Um, you know, a couple times a week, maybe not even that much, maybe even once a week if you can, and 
going in there and just kind of piercing it and just rocking it back and forth. So not necessarily turning, we're just adding, we're infusing it with oxygen. Um, and this is, again, is going to keep those organisms happy. It's also um, by you staying active with your compost pile is going to make it less enticing for the organisms that we don't want in our pile, like rats and mice to come and visit it. So staying active with your pile can be kind of key. Um, where composting gets a bad rat reputation is folks think that we um, it just is too much work and we have to turn it constantly. And that's not really the case if you're going in there and fusing it um, every now and then. But eventually, like I said, you do want to turn it. You want to allow everything on the outside to get on the inside. So that one in the middle picture, um, the contents of that pile came from the um pile to the left so it was in that bin um, and they simply took it out and they're going to redistribute those materials back into the bin um try to get those uh those or those items that we can still visibly see and tell what they were to start out with um to have the chance to be in the center of that pile and how they do this in the industry and large-scale compost operations is they have machinery and they turning is a big part um of that of that world um so it is it's constant that's why they're able to create compost um, quicker than we are uh, because of this uh, machinery. And the other thing that helps by infusing oxygen into our, our pile is some of those bulking agents I mentioned uh, before. So, you know, we don't want everything to be blended up in a mix and added to our compost pile. That doesn't mean it's going to go quicker. You're going to have a hot, wet mess if you do that. Um, so some of those non-woody prunings and tomato stalks and corn stalks, they're going to add um, that, that bulking agent that we need for that oxygen to distribute throughout our pile. So I hope that makes sense. Oh, we're missing, let me just, oh, okay. That was, here we go, a little fancy animation there. So let's just look at some options for our small spaces, come in all different shapes and sizes. Of course, these are the ones on the left here are ones that you would uh, purchase, most of the time made from post-consumer waste versus the one on the right that is pretty fancy looking and made you know, from wood. You can make it from pallets as well. Pallets form really nicely to make, make a bin. So these are great for small spaces. Um, the one there on the left is, uh, you know, I, I, I honestly don't know what Rhode Island Resource Recovery is doing right now during the pandemic, but I know um, right before this that these are the bins that they sell. Sometimes your um, town may offer them at a subsidized rate, so you might want to check in with your with your town on that one. Um, they handle, uh, they take up about three feet um, of backyard space. I think they handle about 11 cubic yards um, and they are made from, again, recycled um, plastic. Uh, they usually have an opened up bottom, so they're easy to move, so you don't have to have them permanently in one place. Um, and the, the center one, you know, kind of known as like tumblers, um, they can get really heavy when they're filled up. Uh, a tip for using one of those ones in the middle is to inoculate it with a shovel full of compost from uh, your the, your previous cycle or just good garden soil just to really inoculate it. The organisms from the soil are going to have a harder time finding their way into there. Um, and sometimes those can be a little harder to rock, but they're really great because they're you, most of the times critter proof. So if you are worried about um, rats and things like that, um, you know, that that might be the, the route to take. And again, like I said, the one on the right um, has a nice little cover, um, make it out of pallets and that can work uh, work as well. I feel like there's one more thing I was going to mention about this, but maybe it'll come back to me. So let's look at some compost bins for larger spaces. Oh, I know what I was going to say. I'm so glad. So sometimes it can be a little awkward to have just one compost pile. And this is, I'm going to get into this, whether we're talking about the bins on the next slide or this slide, because when, when do you stop this process? Um, you know, because you're always going to have food scraps that are accumulating on your kitchen counter. So at some point, you know, you're going to say, okay, family, like the compost pile is full. We're not going to add to this one anymore. We're going to let it finish up um, and let's let's start the, the next one. So a lot of times folks find it a little bit easier to have two compost piles um, just so that you can have one that is active and the other one that is sort of resting. I'll go through that one more time if that wasn't clear there in just another slide or so. 
So compost bins, if you have a little bit more open space or you're in a community garden, um, you know, and we're looking at that one on that right, and you're probably thinking, well, that's not a compost bin. And you're right, it's not. Um, and composting has, you know, before we um, urbanized and, and started dwelling into neighborhoods and things like that, we simply composted in heaps, and that still can be done. Um, but chances are you're probably not going to do that if you have a smaller green uh, green space. But, you know, getting the pile size right, you can see that steam coming right out of that right out of that pile. Um, the one up there on the left uh, can be made from pallets or, you know, if you have a carpenter in your family, um, I'm sure they, they can find the plans online to build something like that. But where this one is neat, and I think this will enforce what I was saying on the slide previously, is this bin up here with the three different slots can really help keep up with a, a, a family um, situation, a community garden situation, uh, because it allows for three different stages of compost. So take the one all the way on the left. Um, that is what we would call the accumulating pile. So as the leaves are falling, um, or you have some newspaper, you're starting to shred that up, you've got some food scraps, you've got some straw, stuff like that, you're, you're just going to start accumulating um, piles. And when that gets full and you've uh, blended the materials correctly, that's when those um, items that are in the first bin are going to go into the second bin. And that way your family members know or your community gardeners know when it's in that second bin, uh, we're not going to add any more materials to it. That's what the first bin is for. So then you can start uh, accumulating those materials over again. And then that third unit just becomes the finishing unit. And that cycle can just continue on and on and on. The bottom left is simply made from poultry wire um, and um, rebar um, and zip ties. You can make it really, really quickly. And this is great um, if you have an abundance of leaves. It's the, These piles are a little bit harder to turn, but there is, I wish I had more time to talk to you tonight about uh, leaf mold um, in Europe. They spell that M-O-U-L-D and we here just say M-O-L-D, but you might want to look it up uh, the two different ways. And it sounds horrible, right? Leaf mold that can't be good, but it actually is really great. And guess what? You only need one ingredient, and that one ingredient is leaves to make leaf mold. So I urge you to look that up. It is an extremely beneficial soil amount, extremely great at holding onto water. Um, it's wonderful. I can't say enough things about uh, making leaf mold. So look that up, and maybe uh, maybe I'll make a presentation on that for the future. All right. So just before we wind down here. Um, I got to give a shout out to my uh, my family, my compost operators. Um, they they were really integral. Um, like I said, my mom had had me doing this when I was younger, and even though I thought it was kind of gross, it is still stuck with me, and I've I've taken much more out of it than I did back then. Um, but we have uh, different roles in our family, from bringing it out to the uh, compost pile to helping it spread it in the garden. Um, we sift our compost pile typically, so we've made a homemade little sifter. That's that middle pile. Because, um, you know, most of the time we're not perfect at making compost and we do have some rubber bands that showed up from our parsley or, like I said, pistachio shells and things like that. So we'll give our compost pile, um, our compost, our finished compost, a sift before we add it into our garden. And there's my bottom little guy, Kylan, who most of the time is helpful, <laughs> most of the time playing. Um, and you can see here in our family, we'll use a simple sign. Um, that just kind of also tells us, and this is our one one of our composting little units here, and we have a little sign that says rest, and that's our compost pile that um, the whole family knows that is not where we're adding our food scraps to. Um, so hopefully this connected the for you guys. You're not, uh, you're, you'll take the challenge, uh, go out there and compost. I'm telling you, it's easy, saves money. If you already have been composting, um, but it hasn't been going so well, Hopefully this connected some of those uh, dots for you. Um, and hopefully you guys will all get a good night's uh, rest tonight. And if there are any questions, I would love to take a few of them right now. If Vanessa's still with us. <laughs> I'm here, great job, this is wonderful. A lot of um, questions about like troubleshooting. So maybe we can get right into those. Couple questions about fruit flies um, and ways, you know, one person said they've had fruit flies, they've been composting for a long time, no odor, nothing with grease or oil, but for the first time they've had hundreds of fruit flies, maybe yeah. due to the drought. 
Yeah, so um, no, I mean, fruit flies can just be an issue. Um, so here's here's my solution, um, and it's not great, but it works. I'm not a huge fan of plastic, which I'm sure a lot of you um, are that are watching um, probably feel the same way, but sometimes Ziploc bags and things like that just really come in handy. We used to use one of those kitchen pails that lived on our counter, and we do sometimes once we get into the colder months. Um, but right now, fruit flies can still be an issue. It's warmer. Those eggs just simply come in um, on our produce and given the right conditions, they hatch. And one year, the fruit flies were so bad that they actually followed my husband in the car to work. And I was almost forbidden from composting altogether. Um, and so what we found as a solution that works is uh, when um, those, those fruit flies can be a, a problem in these warmer months is we use... Uh, Tupperware, something that has a seal or a Ziploc bag. And that way we put those food scraps in. Um, and at the end of the day, we just go and empty it. That re that bag we reuse over and over for that same purpose. We're just watching, washing it out. Um, but by sealing it and closing it, I just find that some of those pails um, just, just sometimes can just create that environment for fruit flies to uh, thrive. So I think that probably that's uh, what the problem problem is is that the fruit flies are are in the in the kitchen not necessarily outside once we put them into our compost pile but if you're noticing them around your compost pile then you just want to make sure you're burying those food scraps more in those in those leaves or whatever you're using so it might be that the ratio is off a little bit too that you haven't been adding enough browns and just too many vegetable scraps yeah that would help yep very... yeah um a lot of questions about eggshells how about using those in the compost bin Okay, so yeah, eggshells is a good question. Um, I, it doesn't really fall into carbon or nitrogen. It, it's high in a lot of you know minerals like calcium and things like that. So uh, what I would say is if uh, eggshells are perfectly fine for the compost pile, um, you can crush them up a little bit. They probably will not fully break down in our backyard compost piles. Um, so when you go to sift it or apply it into your compost, you're going to see little bits and pieces of uh, eggshell. And you know, a little bit is not a uh, is not a bad thing. And of course, it's going to um, return calcium and things like that back in to the soil. Where I would probably answer differently is if you were a chicken farmer and you had a plethora of chickens or a really really big uh, flock of chickens, and you're composting a ton and a ton of eggs, like dozens of eggs, then you can run into um, some some issues. Um, but for the most part, for what we're, you know, backyard composting type of thing, a couple of eggs here and there, um, not a problem at all. Wonderful. A lot of questions about critters. So somebody asked if black mm -hmm. bears could be a problem. A lot of people are having issues with critters or are curious about yeah. rodent, rodent, excuse me, rodent like prevention. Yep. So animals can definitely be an issue. We were really excited when we had a bear um, visit our house. Uh, he was more interested, or she, to be perfectly honest, I'm not quite sure, in the suet than our vegetable garden or our compost pile. No, no issues there. But, um, you know, like I said before, uh, making sure that you try to stay active with your pile, um, making sure that you're covering um, the those fresh food scraps to really silence those smells, put them at bay is going to really help. Um, if you you know are experiencing problems with uh, with critters getting in, then you you'll really need to do some research and look up some line uh, some bins and some homemade bins. Uh, where you can try to even, you know, unfortunately, if you have to, depending on what the critter is that's going in there, you know, bury it into the ground a little bit with some uh, poultry fencing, like, you know, the fine mesh wiring and, and stuff like that. So there are there are a lot of plans and resources out there. I'd be happy if someone is really stuck or having issues, by all means, email us at coopex at uri.edu. I, I do have access to um, some, some compost bins, uh, but I'm sure you can find them as well that are virtually uh, critter proof. Tons of questions here. So how about um, a reminder on the ratio for the compost and then maybe any suggestions on how often to turn it or how to make the composting rate go faster, maybe a little bit of a review, but 
Yeah, yep. So, I mean, you're going to see in a lot of literature that it's, you know, sometimes they'll they'll say three parts brown or three parts carbon to one part uh, nitrogen and um, or food scraps. And sometimes you'll see that as 30 to one and really what they're referring to as a uh, volume. So, you know, I, I hate to sound so not sciencey, but really that is that sort of the art of composting is learning to blend uh, those materials correctly. Um, so you, you do want to have more in terms of, of a volume really of those things that are higher in carbon um, so that you don't end up with this, you know, wet sludgy mess. And the composting process is really forgiving. So if you, you start along that way and all of a sudden you're like, ooh, it does smell. Okay, so if it smells, if it's really, really wet, if, you know, nothing is happening, if it's not getting hot, then chances are you, you the, the ratio is probably off. And most of the time, folks add way too much food scraps and not enough um, leaves or things that are higher in carbon. And I think I felt it's all about having those leaves ready to go in there for people like me. Absolutely, absolutely. So, yeah, I mean, and and you know, break those leaves right into uh, right into the pile if you don't have a way of shredding it, and then they'll be waiting for you. And you know, go out there and just you know, uh, dig out, uh, you know, open it up quite a bit and bury those food scraps, incorporate it into there. When you look at a compost pile, if it were, you know, if it weren't enclosed by a bin, um, a, a good compost pile, you should see nothing um, but those high carbon materials. So you don't want to see any of those things that are higher in, in nitrogen. Those should all be buried and should be in the middle. So don't get in the habit of just dumping those food scraps right onto the top and walking away. Keep those animals out. Uh, keep the process um functioning properly um and add those leaves to the top keep at them somebody said how much water is required so you want it to be like a damp wrung out sponge i've learned that from you over the years yep damp like a wrung out sponge that's right so people are trying to make compost like pretty fast um then you're gonna you know get those ingredients all together and you're going to uh sort of you know make sure that you water it maybe even in the beginning but you know you, again you don't want it to be um soaking wet you want it to be damp like a wrung out sponge so um you know if you were to you know you don't really want to work with your compost in your hands that much but get out there and give it a squeeze or or just visually take a look or go out there and smell um you know it really shouldn't have an odor other than smelling like when we go out into the forest after a wet day um so really if, you're, if it's done if it's done properly you're not going to have those offensive odors and it's not going to be a wet mess so, so what, if it, sponge. what if it is a wet mess or you're realizing, <laughs> oh man, I, I took this class, I have too many nitrogen sources. I mean, you can go back and fix it, correct? That's the thing. It's really, it's, it's forgiving. The process is just going to take longer. Um, you'll know, you know, in that, yeah, you will, you will literally just find some, you will get some more leaves, you will get some newspaper, you'll, you'll, you'll resort to the, the cardboard, even though it's a lot of work and you'll, you'll, you'll mix that in to try to balance out or, you know, go get a bale of straw. That might be the simplest thing. And balance, if you don't have access to those things and, and um, amend it that way. But yes, the compost pile is very forgiving. And that's when the process would start. Um, you know, it, it would just take a, a little bit longer if you had to make any corrective actions along the way. But you know, for, for what we're trying to do here and the type of um, situation that I've described, you can expect compost, you know, in about nine to 12 months, but it could take longer and it could take a lot less depending on, did you shred those leaves? Was it moist like a damp wrung out sponge? So that's why that that time variable is so wide because it really depends on all of those those different those different factors it affects the the rate and the quality. But yes, composting can be quite forgiving, and of course they can always call our gardening hotline if they if they have questions along the way. Perfect. Maybe one last question. Sure. And on how do you know when your compost is done? So yeah. So three bin unit. Some have the black plastic bin, and how do you know? Yeah, I know it's tricky, right? So even like when you were when I was picked. Uh, showing that one from like the town um, from Rhode Island Resource Recovery and those bins. A lot of times in the in the picture, um, they have a little top drawer or top uh, little 
flap at the bottom and the picture will show you opening up and the compost comes trickling out. And uh, for those of you that have uh, tried those, that's not really the case, not really how it works. A lot of a lot of times we just keep that little trap door shut at the bottom and wait for everything to be finished all at once. Um, so let's let's go back to when I was describing that situation where, you know, at some point your compost pile fills up or it gets it gets, you know, larger than you could manage. So you're going to say, OK, I'm going to stop adding material to this pile start another one. So now let's focus. But when is this pile finished? So there's a couple different cues that um, can help us um, understand when the compost pile is finished. First, you're not really going to recognize any of the ingredients to look, um, you know, like like a dark, rich uh, soil. So yeah, you might see that peach pit or that avocado pit, but you're not gonna see the banana peel and you're not gonna see um, you know, some of those ingredients, what they started out as. Um, if you do find a lot of those things, then again, uh, turn it in, um, decide then, mm, you know, is it feeling a little wet? Do I need to add a little bit more carbon or does it just everything on the outside need to get a chance to get on the inside? Okay, so, so one, we'll just recap that one more time. So one, you know when it's finished, when you can't recognize the ingredients. Uh, two, if you have that compost thermometer, which they're, they're they're pretty cheap and they're kind of fun uh, to watch that that comp, that temperature go um, up and down. But when you put the compost thermometer in the compost pile after it looks like everything is done, the temperature in theory would would be the ambient temperature. Um, so it would be the same temperature as what it is outside. So if I went out to my compost pile and I it was 60 degrees outside and I went and I took the compost piles uh, temperature and the temperature was 120. Well, that would be a signal to me that it is not done. There is still uh, food in there. The microbes are still breaking those materials down um, because as they do that, they give off heat. That is where the heat comes from. I forgot to actually mention that in the beginning when I was talking about how the, the heat in the compost pile is not generated from the sun. It's generated from those organisms breaking it down. But we'll, if I went out there on that same 60 degree um, day and I took the compost uh, temperature and it was roughly around, you know, 60, 60 degrees, give or take, and everything looked like it was finished, well, chances are it is finished. Um, and what you can do to just be on the safe side is let it sit just a little bit longer um, and before you incorporate it uh, into your soil. That's called curing. It's kind of like making like, you know, fine fine cheese or fine wine. So curing compost, that's another term you can look up if you want to take it up a notch. I'm glad you addressed that. I, I might have lied. I have one more question because it got asked oh. a lot. How do no your, problem. Um, no problem. <laughs> how do your composting practices change in the winter time? So are you still mm. or, or is anything changing? Yeah, so a little trickier. Um, probably not so much water, but um, you know, I think it, it depends. Composting, if we have a really, really cold winter, yeah, it can get awkward. Your compost pile can definitely freeze and really kind of like slow down. But our, fortunately, our our winters have been kind of mild, but that's kind of a good thing for composting because um, it doesn't get too cold. Um, but it can get kind of tricky when we don't have that abundance of those materials that are high in carbon. So I really urge you to think about that and start accumulating those materials so they're ready for you. Um, because if you're anything like me and my family, we eat a ton of fruits and vegetables year round. Um, so when we, you know, we have a constant supply of those fruits and vegetables going into our compost bin, but if we don't have those other materials to um, cover them right up and keep up with that compost uh, ratio, then we are going to run into a couple of, uh, of issues. So it can get a little trickier in the winter, but with a little bit of pre-planning, um, you can make it work. One thing I want to share is we kind of talked a little bit about urban composting and finding those sources of leaves can be tricky. I would suggest everybody be creative about your local green space. So perhaps you, your, uh, your garden is somewhat near or your compost bin is near a university or a park and you could reach out to, you know, whoever's in charge of that maintenance and they may be more willing to let you take some of the leaves from there. So again, I think reaching out to the community and and um, letting them know, hey, I want to compost. Can I have? Yeah, here, here. Maybe the campaign should be the campaign should be like either leave the leaves or share the leaves. <laughs> share your leaves. 
<laughs> Excellent. So a lot of folks asked about finding the presentation. If you want to just um, go to those ending slides for us, Angel, as a reminder, oh, yeah. this is posted on URI Cooperative Extension's YouTube page. If anyone has additional questions, check out our gardening resources, our environmental hotline. You can email us year round gardener at uri.edu as your composting issues may arise. We may have the answer for you. Also, please. Join us at upcoming learn at home webinar series. I believe is the next one on putting your garden to bed. So another great fall gardening topic. And there's our, our number and email for any um, general questions that you might have. Great. Wonderful. Well, thank you everybody for being with us and you had a good audience for this. Yeah, I'm glad. I'm so so glad to see that um, interest. And Vanessa, if you if you've got one more minute, you should plug plug it in. Plug in the URI Master uh, Program. I'm plug it. So if this was fascinating to you and you are interested in helping your community grow, we encourage you to become a master gardener at our 14 week course where you'll have access to experts. This will be the first year ever that we are offering it completely online. So we hope that that will make this course more accessible to all who are interested in taking it. No prior gardening experience required. What we're looking for are helpers, people who want to help their community. Um, and we are really focused on strengthening the local food system and helping people be better at growing their own food and getting food to those in need. So please check out that application due November 1st. Is that the last one? That's the last one. It's time for rest. <laughs> yes, go let